Thank you, Mr. Damien. Adam. <laughs> I love you. <laughs> just kidding. Hey, you just deleted my sermon. <laughs> you can thank Adam for that. <laughs> I had gotten a text message from Damien, and I'm looking at Adam. Don't act like you've never done that. <clears throat> it's good to see everybody. Merry Christmas. You know, we are we are blessed. And I, I love this I love this time of year. We're gonna kind of deviate from the norm today. We've been in this series in the book of Acts for the past eight weeks, and we're gonna continue that next week. But we're gonna pause this morning and we're going to focus on what God is doing. You know, just my heart is overwhelmed this morning, just looking out over you guys. Genuinely, genuinely love you. Jenny and I are, are privileged to be a part of this church family. This is the best church in the world. I really do believe it. We're thankful for you. This time of year, I always have a tendency to get a little nostalgic. <clears throat> Christmas Day makes 15 years since the first time I started dating a young woman named Jennifer Widmer. Granted, our dating relationship only lasted one week because I proposed the following week. It's kind of a long story, but I'm going to tell it. This young lady I just instantly fell in love with uh, I met her, and I knew I went back that weekend to Cross for the Nations where I was going to school, and I told my roommate I met my wife. He said I was a moron. He was, he was right, but so was I. I did meet my wife, and I came back from school, and I mean, we were friends, but on Christmas night, the year 2000, I never will forget, I kissed my wife. It was on my parents' couch after they had gone to bed. And sorry, guys. No, I'm not. <laughs> and then I asked her to be my girlfriend. The following week, uh, I met with her father, and I asked if I could have her hand in marriage. And he's looking at me like, who are you? <laughs> and if I'm not mistaken... He used words similar to this. He said, yes. He said, yes, but, you know, let's let's give some time and just get to know you. And y'all, basically, yes, but a little bit down the road. I proposed the next day. I heard yes, and I'm, I just turned everything off. And I left for Romania the following day. And this is all going to tie in in a minute. I'm not just reminiscing for reminiscence sake but I left for Romania for a couple of months to plant a church uh, with WME and that's what I wanted to do with my life is be a missionary that's what I've always wanted since I was 17 went on my first mission trip and it was set that's what I wanted to do and then God brought this woman in my life that had similar aspirations and similar callings and and a similar passion for for the Lord and we were engaged, and I came back two months later to a woman that I, I barely knew. But we started dreaming. You remember that time when you're dreaming what life is going to be about? I, I've once heard him say, and this is not true in my case, but I've once heard people say that if dating is a dream, that marriage is the alarm clock. <laughs> but we started dreaming. Ours has not been that way. It's, the dream's just gotten better. drop the shovel and quit digging for a second, but we, uh, we made these plans of, well, we're going to be married six months, and then after six months, we're going to have all of our affairs in order, not that we owned anything, but we're going to sell everything that we had, and we're going to go live and die on a mission field for Jesus. We're going to start orphanages. We had this beautiful, beautiful vision. You remember what it's like when you were dreaming of what life is going to be like. You remember that time. 
Some of us are still dreamers. Some of us have lost the capacity to dream again because of experiences that we've walked through in life. But we were walking through this situation of just what's it going to be like and dreaming of marriage and missions and even my groom's cake was a cake and I think it had the world on it and it said go into all the world. That's what we wanted to do. And God had another plan. And this morning, that's what I'm going to talk about, the God interruption. Because at its core, the Christmas story is about God interrupting history. That's exactly what it is. And we had this interruption. I told you we both had these call to missions and we we wanted to do this and we got married under the auspices of, of going and living and dying on the mission field. I worked for Daniel at Parcells which is not a good thing to do if you're a big guy because that's really good stuff down there. But we were going to work, and then we were going to go. That, that's it. We were going we to go. Well, the month after uh, we got married, God came and interrupted our plans. Have you ever had a God interruption in your life? You know, we, the Bible says there's a way that seems right to a man. You know, we have a lot of things that we thought were right. And I'm just telling you my story for a second because I, I'm going to tie it into the Christmas story in a second. But a, a missionary came, and he gave us a prophetic word. And, you know, I'm not the guy that just takes a prophetic word and I go do that immediately. I, I need a confirmation from the Holy Spirit. You know, I, I appreciate the prophetic, but I don't just take that and automatically change my life. But because of that word, it confirmed something God was doing in me already. One month after our marriage, we had this beautiful plan. God came and interrupted. And this guy gave us a word, and this dude read my mail. You know, where I, it was just no mistake, and it was from God. And then he said something that made me want to just scream when he said it. Have you ever had a word from God or something from the Lord that you just personally didn't want to do? When your will came in conflict with God, this guy gave us a word and said, the Lord is speaking to you, and he read my mail, and he did all this stuff, and he said, God is telling you, you God's, he's going to use you. And I'm like, yes, that's what we want. And you, you're going to be a, a voice for the kingdom of God. I'm like, yes, that's what we want. We're ready. We're married. We've got these plans. And he said, but what I'm going to say is going to shock you. And he told me, he said, the Lord says, God's going to use you in the United States, and he's asking you to be a pastor in the United States. And when he said that, the Holy Spirit said, Christian Fellowship, this is year 2001. And it didn't shock me like he said it was going to shock me. It angered me. Because that's not what I wanted to do. We had dreams. We had plans. We had, we had things that we were going to do. And all of a sudden, God inserted himself into our plans. At its core, that's what the Christmas story is about. We're going to look this morning in Luke chapter 1. God interrupting our plans. Look at Luke chapter 1 verse 26. And hopefully in the middle of this message you can find yourself somewhere in this. How many people know that God has nothing but good for us? God will never hurt you. God will never lead you down a path that's going to lead you to destruction. He has plans and futures for our lives and our destinies in God are always good. It might come in conflict with what we want, but God wants nothing but good. Luke chapter 1 verse 26, we're going to look at the plans of a young lady. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. Just in those two verses, I want you to think about your plans when you were in that place. Mary was engaged to a man. We know that he was a carpenter. They were engaged just like I was for one week, or I'm sorry, we dated for a week. We were engaged for that just short time before we got married. But we were dreaming, and I guarantee you, in that season, Mary was dreaming of what life is going to be like after she marries this carpenter, Joseph. Because I know this is not something that's appealing to women today, but Mary had this guy 
He was a strong guy. He owned his business. He was a carpenter. He's out there sweating, and he's got this just masculinity all over him. That's not appealing to women today. You don't want that. No, you do. Joseph is the owner of a business. She's dreaming. Oh, man, this business is going to explode. It's going to be awesome. Maybe Joseph was building houses. Maybe he was building rocking chairs. We don't know, but he was a carpenter, and he was good at it. She's dreaming of that one special day that they're going to become husband and wife. You know, I do a lot of weddings. I'm always nervous doing weddings because I know that that bride has dreamed her entire life of what this one day is going to be like. And my biggest fear is that I'm going to say something that's going to mess it up. I remember your son's wedding, Paul and Dusty. This is a, Ricky Cunningham is a master at doing weddings. He memorizes the entire ceremony. He's far superior to me in this. And he had gone just perfect. Not a note. He goes through the vows, everything. I'm like, wow, this is impressive. Until he dismisses the crowd and he, said, he was going to say, Paul and Dusty would like to welcome everyone in a reception in their honor at the Murray Women's Club. But he missed up one word. He said, Paul and Dusty would like to welcome you to a reception in their honor at the Murray Women's Clinic. <laughs> you remember that? It was awesome. That, that's my biggest fear. I'm going to have one little slip, and that's what's going to be remembered the rest of their lives. But they're dreaming about what that one special day is. Mary is envisioning this beautiful, beautiful wedding day. And she's got this dress that's obviously far superior than any wedding dress that anybody has ever worn. Matter of fact, when she takes that dress off, they're going to retire that dress and put it in a museum because of the beauty of this dress. That's how great it's going to be. And they are going to have to put out chairs for this wedding because everybody is going to come. The reception, the food is going to be just off the hook. It's going to be unbelievable. Everybody's going to be talking about it for three months about how great the wedding food was. How beautiful she looked. Can't you see it? That's the picture that she's in. And then they think, okay, we're going to get married and this business is just going to boom. We are going to be number one in the yellow pages. When they look under carpentry, there's Joseph's picture. He's going to be right there. This is going to be our life. And then they started dreaming about what kids would, obviously kids would come along. But before they do, they're going to have this just perfect romance that the dating relationship just increases. Every single day, Joseph is going to come home with a rose, and he's going to tell her how lovely she is and how great of a wife she is. Now, I know that's not the dream of anybody else, but that was Mary's dream, just the beautiful dream of life. And then they're going to have these dates. It's going to be about once every two days. They're going to go out, and sometimes it'll just be a picnic on the Mount of Olives, but Joseph is always going to put her first. She's going to be the prize of his life. She's dreaming of what life's going to be like. And then kids are going to come along one day, and when they do, oh my goodness, they're going to be the best kids that the world has ever seen. They will be invited to join Mensa at age five. They're going to be brilliant. Halos will sprout. They're going to be incredible. In the school, teachers are going to come say, your, st your children are the best. There's no student that's ever walked through Jerusalem Academy like your children, Mary. That They are the pride of all of Israel. Now, I know you've never thought that about your kids, but Mary had these dreams of what life was going to be like. She's engaged. Don't you remember that time when you were engaged to your spouse and you started dreaming of what life was going to be like? Everyone say, we have plans. But the problem came, and it wasn't a problem. It was a good thing. Her plans met the God interruption. Say the God interruption. Mary had plans, and I guarantee you, this did not come into play in these plans. So we've got the back story in those first two verses. Mary's got plans. She's engaged. She's dreaming of life. We've got a man that owns a business. It's going to be a beautiful life together, just like Jenny and I had plans. And then God interrupted. And then the angel came and said to her, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying, 
and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Don't be afraid, Mary, for you found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great, and he'll be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And his kingdom, there will be no end to it. And Mary said to the angel, How in the world can this possibly be remotely true, being I'm a virgin? And he said to her, no, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. And behold, your relative Elizabeth in her old age has conceived a son. And this is the sixth month of her who was called barren. For nothing, say nothing, nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, behold, I am the servant of the Lord and the greatest words that anybody can ever say in their life. Be it unto me according to your word. And the angel departed from her first thing we talked about is Mary had plans. And I guarantee you it's like the plans you had when you were in the stage of life that she was in. Until the God interruption. Let me tell you something about our lives. And I know there's people in here this morning that you're visitors or you're not normally in a tender, but I want you to hear me this morning. God will let us live our lives and be just fine. You know, Mary could have lived her life. She could have lived her plans, and she would have been just fine. She would have been happily married to a carpenter, and they would have done their thing. Her dreams, that some of them would have come true. Some of them, she would have realized that Joseph was a man. And this night in shining armor, when marriage shows up and his breath stinks in the morning, all of a sudden the allure, you know what I'm talking about. Like, who is this guy? His hair didn't look like he did, and... In her case, I can't run my fingers through my night's hair anymore. What's going on? She would have been just fine. But let me tell you something for your life. Just fine is not enough. God will let you live your life according to your plans. But God wants to interrupt your plans and insert himself into your life and give you a life that goes far beyond what your plans and your dreams could take you. And all we have to do is stop and say, yes, Lord, be it unto me according to your word. At the core of the Christmas story, there is a girl who had dreams and plans just like we did. 14 to 16 year old virgin girl that's betrothed and engaged to a man that's about to be married who had plans and dreams. And at the core of the Christmas story, there's a girl that interrupts her plans because God interrupted them. And she says, yes, be it unto me according to your word. Back to our story. And our God interruption in 2001. Mary was good. She said, be it unto me according to your word. But I didn't like the God interruption in our life. So I wrestled with it. And I fought, and I'm like, no, no, I don't, I don't think that's, that's what I want to do. And unfortunately, that's where most of us end up landing a lot of times in our lives, when we feel God calling us and pushing us into his interruption for our lives. We find ourselves standing against it, saying no. But finally, after about two weeks, I said, Lord, this is not what I want to do, but be it unto me according to your word. Just like Mary did. And it didn't take long at all till I realized God knows a lot better than we do. God has a greater life for us than we could ever imagine. God has destinies and purposes on our lives that are far greater than we could ever dream up in our own conjuring and dreaming. We have plans. But then there's the God 
interruption. And I want you to look at the beauty that came out of the God interruption. If I had a third point, it'd be this. The beauty that comes out of the God interruption. Mary would have never, ever, ever dreamed that this was God's will. But when God interrupted, she just said yes. And I want you to look what came out of it. Luke chapter 2, verse 1. And in those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration where Quirinius was governor of Syria, and all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up, the knight in shining armor, from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and the lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son. And she wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. And I know this isn't earth shattering because you've heard this story and you've read this story a thousand times. Every time you sit down with your family at Christmas, you read this story, you think about the reason for the season. We write that on the core of our house, on the side of our house. Jesus is the reason for the season, and he really is. But I want you to stop and pause this morning, and I want you to just think about the seriousness of this. It started with a girl that allowed a God interruption in her life. And it changed her plans, it changed her course, it changed her destiny. And I want you to look at the beauty that came out of this. We were lost in our sin. We were alienated from God. And she said yes to God. And God sent his son through her. To come redeem lost humanity. And he finds himself in a manger. And in the same region there were shepherds out in the field. Keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them. And the glory of the Lord shone around them and they were filled with fear and the angel said to them fear not for behold I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people for unto you is born this day in the city of David a savior who is Christ the Lord and this will be the sign for you you will find this baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and laying in a manger And suddenly there was an angel, a multitude of heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those whom he is pleased. And when the angel went from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste, and they found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger, And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told to them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered what the shepherds had told them. And this is the verse. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. God has an ability in our lives if we will let him. If we will let him. You see, we're the problem. We get in the way of God's destinies and his plans on our lives. If we will let him come and insert himself into our dreams and into how we're living our life and say, yes, God, there will come a time that you will be able to look back at the treasures that God has given you because you simply said yes. God can turn the unknown and the fearful things in our lives into a treasure box. And it turns into something beautiful. She would have never dreamed it up. But that's what happened. Her plans met God's interruption. She said yes. And now she's at this place of looking back. She would have never planned it this way. But that's exactly how it happened. And she's sitting there thinking, Lord, in a million years, if I would have had to draw up my life, it would have never been this. But now I look back at the treasures that I have in you. And with Jen and I, back to our story, I'm at a place, and that's why I'm so nostalgic this Christmas season, I guess. 
it's hit me because I feel like that the Lord has opened up our treasure box. And I'm looking at people in this place that if I would have lived my life the way that I wanted to live it, I would have been just fine. I would have been fine. It would have been a good life. But I look at all the treasures that I would have missed. Right here's one. <laughs> Damien. <laughs> I'd have never known this guy. He said, thanks, Scott. I would have never known anybody that's in here at this point because I wouldn't have been here. And I look at our lives, the people sitting in the pews of this church is the greatest treasure in my life. I was talking this week about, if you on Facebook, if I could have $10 million or a relationship that I knew would stick with me and beside me and be a true friend, I'd take the relationship because life is about people. And I'm telling you, I tell you, I love you every week. This church, you are the greatest treasure in my life. <coughs> Got a Christmas present last night from Kaylee. She gave me this coffee cup. But on the coffee cup, it had our church logo. It's an awesome gift. It just really melted my heart. And I messaged her last night. I said, you pretty much encapsulated the true treasures in my life. Coffee in this church. You're slightly above coffee. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Our plans met God's interruption, and it always turns into a treasure box that you can look back, and you would have never had these things. We love you guys, and God has a purpose on our lives. And God was speaking to me this morning, and I know this is simple, and I've talked about similar things before. But there's people in this building that's in three different places. And I've got a couple of verses for you. The first one is this. You may be living a life like Mary. And you may have plans. But God is calling you out of the mundane. God's calling you out of a mundane existence of living life for ourselves. God's calling you into... His plan. That verse in Jeremiah says, For I know the plans that I have for you, says the Lord. They're plans for good and not evil. Plans to give you a future and plans to give you a hope. Let me tell you something. God's plans on your life are always good. You might not like it initially, but if you jump in and say like Mary did, be it unto me according to your word. Man, you will live the greatest adventure that you could ever imagine. Because you know you're in that perfect place that God has stationed you to be. And there's nothing like it. See, some of us being just fine is okay. And I'm not condon condemning you for that. But for me, I don't want a life of just fine. I don't want a life of existing. I don't want a life of just making it through. I want to be in the exact place that God wants me to be. I want to accomplish every single thing that God has for me to accomplish on my life. And I know that's in our heart too. We have that hole in us that desires to mean something. We want to mean something. We want to do something that has some type of value. Nobody wants to have on their gravestone written the word irrelevant. You know what? They were good. They didn't do anything. They were irrelevant. First thing we got to do is realize God is calling us out of the mundane. And I want you to hear me on this. You didn't have to hear me on anything else I said. But I'd like for you to hear me on this. There's some people that have said yes to the God interruption. And you said, yes, God, I've had plans but I felt you calling me out of it, and I said yes. And the truth is, you may be living in the midst of a trial. And it didn't quite work out the way that you thought it would work out. I did, Richie. 
I did say yes to God. I was having my dreams, and he came, and he called me, and I stepped out. And since then, there's been nothing but trouble and heartache and trial and pain. I've struggled ever since I said yes. You talk about living in a treasure box. I feel like I'm living in a pit. Now, I know I'm not talking to anybody in this building. But the verse for you is, all things work together for the good of those that love the Lord and that are called according to his purpose. And let me tell you something. God is the God of the final word. And those things that you are experiencing right now in hurt and hardship and trial, we still serve the great Redeemer. And if you will just keep on holding on, His word will turn into truth in your life. Hold on to what He said because His word is true. God, I said yes but I'm experiencing hurt. Hold on a little longer because he is the great redeemer and his word is true. And every one of those situations that you are saying are so hard, you'll be just like Mary. And there'll be a time you look back and you say, oh, Jesus, that hurt. But I see what you did through that and that's in my treasure box now. (laughs) I look back, I see that you moved through this. That's the kind of God we serve. We serve that kind of God that doesn't just leave us abandoned. God has not called you into heartache. God's not called you into pain. But we've got to be willing to hold on through the trials to get to the treasure. Hear me again. Hold on through the trials to get to the treasure because we serve the great Redeemer. And the Bible just simply says all things work together for the good of those that love the Lord and are called according to His purpose. That doesn't say some things. That says all things. Let me tell you, God is not taken back and surprised by the hardship you're experiencing here today at this Christmas season. He's not sitting around frantic, rubbing His hands together. What am I going to do? His word is true. All things work together for the good of those that love the Lord and are called according to His purpose. If you look at my, I'll call it portly body, I've got scars, I've got bruises, got a lot of things that's none of your business. To show up. And truly, that's what my life is too. I got a lot of scars. Got a lot of bumps and scrapes. Got a lot of things that I wished I didn't have to walk through. I got something on my chin right there. Hair won't grow there. I'll have this beautiful beard like I did this fall. It was just pure glory. But this one spot, a little line right there. T-ball. Got knocked into a fence and had to go to, you remember that, Mom? Had to go to the emergency room. They put stitches in it. Scared me silly. It's just part of who I am now. This scar on my chin. I got scars on my feet. I got the ugliest feet this side of the Mississippi. (laughs) Thanks, Dad. Just all cut up. Had to walk through some things, blew out both of my Achilles, got big scars around the back of both of my feet, got scars on my shoulder, got scars in a lot of places. Just means I've walked through something. But look, I can move every one of those parts today. Might not have hair growing there, but it's just a reminder I had something that happened. God has an ability to heal those things in our lives that hurt. And we walk through those things, and you look back, just because we're full of scars doesn't mean God hasn't been faithful. A scar is proof that he was faithful. A scar is proof that I walked through something, and he healed me and brought me through it because he's faithful. God is faithful, and he has the ability to move your trials 
into your treasure box. Because all things work together for the good of those that love the Lord and are called according to His purpose. Let God interrupt your plans. Let God redeem your trials. And the last thing is, maybe you're in this place this morning. Take stock in this Christmas season. I wish that we could do it year round. Something magical seems to land on people about the day after, well, maybe not the day after Thanksgiving, but that's Black Friday. Something does land on them. It's not of God. <coughs> Somewhere in December, that Christmas spirit seems to land, and we kind of get in this nostalgic mood where we're just thankful. Let me tell you something. Live in that. Be thankful this season. God is good. Some of us are in the place that we need to take stock of what's in our treasure box, and we need to turn it into praise to Jesus. Lord, I realize you brought me from this to this. You brought me from death to life. You brought me through this situation. And it's time. We're, we're sitting holding a treasure box full of treasures, but we're walking around grumpy, offended at everybody, upset. Be thankful for what God's done in your life. Open that box and take a look at the faithfulness of God and just begin to let praise flow out of your life. I'm telling you, we serve a faithful, good God. And those things that don't matter, that we've been holding on to so tight, let them go and take a good stare at the goodness and faithfulness of God in your treasure box and just begin to praise Him. I've been overwhelmed this week with what God has done. In our lives these last 15 years, from the first time I kissed that woman on my parents' couch after they had gone to bed, <laughs> we had plans. Didn't work out the way that I thought it was going to work out, but I'm so thankful I let God come in and I said yes. And now this week, I've just been looking at this treasure box that God has done in my life. And I've just felt this overwhelming praise. And your faces in this church have just been coming before me. I'm like, God, thank you so much. Thank you that you brought this person into our lives. They've become such a treasure and a treasured friend, Lord. Lord, thank you for allowing this person to go to this place and do this for you. That's become such a treasure for me. Last night we had ten youth at our house we do this I do this discipleship group on Mondays I really love and after they left my heart just got overwhelmed I'm like God thank you for these guys they're just a treasure in my life Lord can't you see that we have plans and if we just stop and say God yes whatever you're calling us to it leads to this life of just goodness because he knows the plans he has for you and they're good He's trustworthy. Father, we thank you this Christmas season, Lord. Lord, may this be a lifestyle, Lord, that we can just submit our ways into your hands and let you direct our paths, Father. Lord, I thank you. That one interruption that came in the history of man, Lord, that's never going to happen again. Lord, you've sent Jesus Christ to die once and for all for our sins through Mary. But in her heart and in her attitude, Father, she's a human just like we were, Lord. May we learn the lessons from her and live that life of, yes, Lord, be it unto me according to your will. Lord, may we not hold so tightly our ways and our, our demands and the way that we think things ought to go. But may we just release that and say, yes, Lord, be it unto me according to your word. I choose you. I say yes. And Lord, when things start happening that seem to be coming against that, Lord, may we rest in the fact that you are the Redeemer and that all things will, in the end, turn into a treasure, Lord, because your word is true. So this morning, Lord, we just open up our box, Lord, and we just say thank you. Thank you for your goodness, Lord. Just personally, Lord, I thank you, Father, for redirecting my life. Lord, I thank you, Jesus, for your faithfulness, Lord, these last 15 years, God. Lord, I thank you that you've never left us, you've never forsaken us, Lord. I thank you, Lord, that you've never abandoned us, Lord. Lord, I thank you you've been there every step of the way. Lord, I thank you for the treasures, Lord, that you've given us. 
Lord, in the, in the people in this place, Lord. Lord, I thank you, Father, that you've placed true treasured friendships and family in our lives. Lord, we give you praise for that. And just looking back, Father, you're so good. You're so good to us, Jesus. This morning I choose to let go of things that simply do not matter, Lord. And I say thank you, Lord, because you're faithful. Lord, you're trustworthy and you're faithful. Can we just praise Him this morning? Lord, we love you, Jesus. Lord, we love you. Lord, you're faithful, Jesus. Lord, you're good, Lord. Lord, though the road has been hard, Lord, we praise your name, Jesus. Lord, though we got a lot of bumps and scrapes and bruises and scars, Lord, you've been faithful through them all. And Lord, we might not see the faithfulness yet, Lord, but you are. There might still be bleeding, Father. We might still be hurting, but that'll turn into a scar, and you'll heal it, Lord. Lord, and we cling to your word, Lord, that the things we're walking through now, Lord, will become a treasure because all things will work together for our good. Lord, we thank you, Jesus, for your faithfulness. We thank you, Lord, for your love. We thank you, Lord, for not leaving us to a life that's just fine. Or just okay that you've called us into greatness Lord we thank you Jesus for the destinies Lord we thank you for the good futures for the hope that you've placed in our lives Lord that might not have been our experience before but it's what you've called us into Jesus and this morning Lord we pause if only for a moment Lord to just say thank you Thank you for interrupting our mundane, boring life, Lord, and breathing in life to us, Jesus. Lord, you're faithful, God. You're faithful, Lord Jesus. You are faithful, God. Father, in the name of Jesus, I just bless this congregation, Father. Lord, I pray in 2016, Lord, that it will be the best year, Father, that we've seen yet. Lord, I pray that we will feel you, we will know you're there, Lord, in the deepest, darkest places that we walk through, Father. Lord, and as we stand on the mountaintop, Lord, and we may we not forget that it was you that brought us there, Lord. Lord, we're expecting good things. Father, we trust you and we firmly plant ourselves in you. Lord, I bless this congregation and our church family today, Father, with every good and perfect gift from you, Father. Lord, I speak life into their lives, Father. Speak health into their lives in the name of Jesus. I speak the peace of God that passes all understanding. May it guard their hearts and minds, Father. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. I love you guys. Love on each other as you're dismissed this morning.